Murphy's Law says, if something can go wrong, it will. This is especially true in creative work and creative life in general. Because if you're bringing something from an idea to reality, you don't even know what you're gonna face. And certainly other people have no idea what you're dealing with to actually make that happen. Entrepreneurial life, brand owner life is the same way. You have no idea what's gonna come up and it's gonna come up and it's gonna be a nightmare. So the masters of this and the people that thrive inside these creative careers or as brand owners often aren't the most talented. It's the ones that don't get hung up on adversity. And even more importantly, don't get hung up on things in their head. They simply work through it. The challenge becomes the craft. In this video, I'm gonna tackle obstacle solving because my life is in a really complicated place right now. So I'm dealing with it in real time. And I think walking through some of those actual examples will be really valuable. Now I can talk about frameworks for creative problem solving and brand owner obstacle erasure. They're really relevant no matter where you're at in your career and what you're dealing with and that every creative person down inside deals with and would benefit from getting better at. So I'll start with walking through some issues I'm working through with developing a product. So I'll go a little bit deeper than most brand owners would on how that works. Some of the issues in the overall balance of creative life of like launching a brand and the things you do in a brand, making content, etc. And then I'm gonna go through basic, basic strategies for removing obstacles. Because what usually happens is people just get caught up. Something happens in your head, you don't know how to solve it, it hangs over it, you don't do it. This can apply at work where you just are frustrated that you can never actually make that shift you want to make better creative or explain this to your boss or get to some objective. Happens as a brand owner when you're like, how do I even solve this thing that's come up? Happens when you start a creative or like a visionary project you wanna do, but you're stuck somewhere and it's an extra thing so it fades away. You should be able to conquer all of that. I want you to conquer all that. So I'm going to explain how I handle it, some really concrete examples. I'm just going to give you a toolkit that I think will be really valuable for every obstacle that will come here. Now I'll start with everyone passes the buck in their lives and their relationships, most of all at work. Someone else should do that or it's someone else's fault. You do not want to be that person. You want to be the one that can and does fix it. And when you are consistently a fixer, you want to be the kind of person that enables others to fix it. And instead of being like, you do this, brings them up so that they also want it. Because the time will come when you want to do something for you. This could be you want to launch a freelance project, you want to have a brand one day. I mean, you want to be a parent. And you're going to realize that every excuse you've ever had, every I'm going to get stuck in this obstacle, everything that holds you back in your head is going to stop you from achieving whatever dream or vision or stop you from where you want to be in life. And if you're the person that solves that, that's changed that dynamic, you can win through any of those things. You can get the things that you want and it's worth shifting that framework. So here's where I'm at. I do a lot of things. I'm a content creator. I'm a partner in multiple businesses. I may like in deep, like spending a significant portion of my week advisor to two other businesses. I have my programs like Cut30. We have our big newsletter, which is hyper. And I as a team, there are more people than just me involved in making all those things happen. And it takes a, the vast majority of the week to get those things done. And I'm fresh on the heels of trying to do some of those things while also at a full-time job. Luckily that's behind us. But now I'm trying to add a brand on top of that as well. The brand was supposed to launch this week, but we hit timing issues. And I'm really excited to talk about some of this stuff because every, you get the L, L, L1, like level one breakdowns of like brand owner issues or how brands work. How do I solve this? How do I start this thing? But you don't get like the level two. Like people rarely like actually give breakdowns that are super tactical. If you can tell from my other content, I am here to do that and explain pretty much whatever. So here's how timing and the kind of decisions you have to deal with with timing. So I have shoes at the warehouse. They've been there for a minute, but I had laces done by somebody else to include extra laces in the box because I wanted to be able to have rope laces as well as thick laces. My factory is just working to get the core stuff done. I was like, I'll do the rope laces separately. I'd already done rope laces with the factory and another project. I'll just use them. I shipped it. They're not there yet. They should be there. No concrete time on when they will be there. Don't have a track. I also got insoles added to these shoes, but the vendor shipped them separately. So I've had all the shoe boxes show up, but the insoles still aren't there. We're not sure. There's another one. We're like, there's a tracking number. It says it should be there any day. We'll see. But once it gets to a warehouse, it actually has to get intook. So Pietra is my 3PL. 3PL is third party logistics. They ship and send things out for brands for a fee versus doing it yourself. I have been through shipping out of my garage in my life. I have no desire to do that again. And so I'm paying for someone else to do it. It costs a storage fee to have my stuff sit there. There's a pick and pack fee. So every order, there's a cost per item in the order to get it added. And then you can do what's called kitting. And kitting is super useful. This means if multiple things show up, they can combine them or you know add adjustments into stuff to kind of put your order together. Perfect example of kitting. This bag contains the Cobra hood. I ordered the bag separate from the hoodie. They both showed up to the factory. I said, hey, take the Cobra hoodie out of the existing bag and put it into these bags. So like drawstring and cooler bags. And they did that. It cost me $1 per item for them to do all that. And now I can ship them in this new branded experience, which I like better than the poly bag they have. It's reusable, et cetera, et cetera. I'll save the other bags for an item that's not as nice. But that's something I can do with kidding. Now with the shoe product, right? I have laces coming and I have 
inserts coming, I'm gonna want them to get into it, which means when it arrives at the warehouse, they count it, they inventory it. I do a setup process, we link it to Shopify. It's like anywhere between two and four days to basically go from it arrives at the warehouse to it's actually live and I can sell it on Shopify and the systems are sane. Then there's also days like set up and execute kidding. They actually combine all those things into one so I'm not having to have them go pick and pack three items and create a bundled skew with three things to add the laces and the insoles to the shoe order. So I'm already looking at, even though this thing is live in the warehouse and ready to go, if I wanna have my full experience, whenever it arrives, I'm looking at like six, eight business days until it goes. So that's like two weeks right there. And I can choose, do I want the consumer experience I want or I want to ship the things I have now without the custom insoles, without the laces and save those for later. I am luckily in the position where this isn't my main living, right? I do all these other things, the brand is on top of it, I'm not sweating the money from it, so I will wait for the experience to be perfect. But this is the things that you juggle as a brand owner, because at that same time, the core things for the release, all the shirts like, like this and the bags, um, the knits and stuff are all coming from one factory. They're supposed to be there by the 25th at the warehouse. They are in LA as of the 25th, but not gone to the warehouse in the Carolinas. So there's not like a target date. It's going to be a couple days. So those will have to get into it and stuff too. In addition with those shoes, I shipped a bunch out to get photography done. They're supposed to arrive here at my house so I can shoot a bunch of them. But then UPS basically said it was Thursday, then it was Friday. Now it's scheduled for Monday. God knows when UPS is going to get them. I don't know how hard it is to get five pairs of shoes somewhere, but like that's what you deal with, right? Because then I have to be able to turn those creative assets around in time. And so now I'm going to be in a crunch because I'm going to China to deal with a separate issue on Friday. I will dive into that other issue. So I'm developing sneakers, as you know. I work on some other colorways that I had a really uh, sick color guy I work with to go do some colorways. This is not the colorway we're looking for. These are not the blues and the, and the pinks that we want on this and I'm going back and forth to the factory we're not hitting a, there's a couple colors we're working on and it's just not quite right because it's not as easy as just matching the pantone especially when it comes to like suede it's about availability everything's kind of close we're shipping it back and forth i'm sending stuff through email you look at like the xiaomi phone pictures you get from a china factory the color isn't representative of what you actually get so it's hard to make decisions and so the real answer for me is i need to go there because especially with that i'm looking at other souls it's like too much back and forth let me just go i can look at every option they have i can go to these massive fabric marts and i can actually make decisions and work with them on the ground so i'm going to china but that now is a okay there's a firewall in china so you actually can't use a bunch of the normal internet like social media which i have to post on every day and it's really slow to upload stuff so i'm gonna have to get someone else to post and do workflow and cull these videos before i actually go to china and now i'm working around all those logistics and you know i'm six three i'm not traveling in coach so it's gonna be like 6k for me to go business to china well at the same time i'm realizing like all this release is gonna go for 8 15 so august 15th it's a pretty good time for a brand release right like that's a good entering into fall if i want to do another release you know i'd like to think it's 60 days right I order something, 30 days they're produced, 30 days they arrive by boat. But really it's like with intakes and the stuff we talked about before and a couple of delays, 75 days. So if I put in orders by the end of the month, which is coming up in this next week, then I'm looking at like mid-October, end of October. And so if you want to have consistent drops, you have to be ahead of it. I haven't sold anything from this first drop yet to gauge where this is going. I have to start making calls. And at the same time, I'm looking at like some of the product nuance choices here. Like I have this fabric I absolutely love in this blue for, for one of these shirts. It's great for this like lighter weight versus the ultra heavyweights here. But then, but then I also have this washed version. It was like a very unique look of the fabric. It's a unique fabric, a little bit heavier in a different way. And it's like softer. It's almost like an almost sweatshirt, but it hangs like a tee. And it's like, all right, I could do this. I could do the wash. But like I have to be able to make those decisions, validate those things, put those orders in, deal with the development we're working on. Like I'm doing pants at the same time. These are uh, like a crop pants, like loosely based on a rick. But like I had to fix this drawstring. I want to remove some of the, like I changed a couple things by an inch and see the other color and fabric options. I can make calls and get it sampled if I want to have bottoms out for And so it's like, all right, now I should handle a bunch of that in China, but now I need to define all the things I want to know in China, make sure they have them ready and prepared for when I arrive there, be following up on that every day and organize on it. Like that's the kind of stuff you're dealing with every moment when you're a brand owner. And in addition to that are these hoodies that came from Turkey. They were a nightmare. I'm not working with this factory again. They look amazing. Cobra on the back, wash is excellent, weight is excellent, fit is excellent. They shipped them late. They misquoted the shipping. They were horrible to deal with, but the product's worth it. But then the samples that I got have been both dyed and washed. These are just dyed. And the wash they have on it needs another wash to get all the dye out. And so for a lot of people that buy washed clothes or buy clothes that have like pigment dyes, garment dyes on them, they know they should just like wash everything in cold water once before they put it in with other things. Or they should be only washing their darks with their darks. A lot of, so there's a lot of people that don't know that. So now I'm like, all right, because these actually need a wash to get all the extra pigment out, I need to let everyone, because I don't want to have a consumer to have a bad experience where they buy the hoodie and they have it washed it and all of a sudden they put it in with whites and a bunch of clothes get black on. So I'm working to solve a bunch of these issues at once, right? So I can solve the hoodie issue. Like none of these are like, hey, I need to stop and this is a a life-changing obstacle. The hoodies I'm basically explaining. On the product page, I list that out. Email to every customer that orders it that explains what the washing instructions are. Care like label or something I insert in the box. I can do the 
20% chance of an issue down to a 2% chance of an issue. All the product decisions, I need to organize exactly what I need, communicate it, put a list on it, follow up with it. The timing, I need to basically be able to make a decision. Yeah, I want to adjust this timing. What does that mean? How do I shift my assets, make a list, act? But then there's the more, uh, the non-product related things going into the brand where I'm running ads for this brand. And I've run Facebook ads my like, whole career. And I still run now for brands I work with still are spending like 20, 30K a month, which then it goes above the comfort level I have and onto the next one. But I've been trying to learn to get better because now I'm using my own specific money for something I am 100% like ownership of besides cult partners and I want to be sure I'm doing the best thing so I joined meta ads at scale which is like a program where you actually like are involved in a community and you get like regular calls someone helps you workshop and onboard these kind of things and teaches you more about it. and with that means I now have a schedule of creative I have to add I'm monitoring ads that I'm running I'm trying to create SOPs so someone else can run those ads underneath it and adding that on at the same time while also trying to create content in addition to the content I make I put out five to six short form videos a week I put out one to two YouTubes a week I'm now adding brand content on top of that and realizing I can do a little bit of it but not all of it so I need content creators to do that. So to get a content creator to do that and get designers and teams to help with creative, I need to both identify who those are and to be able to develop briefs for them. And to develop briefs, I need references. To you know, develop the references, I need to basically have like time around locking that in. I need to break down all those steps and act on it or it's not going to happen. And I need to communicate. There's a lot of people involved with this brand. Not everyone knows what's going on. Timing's changing. Some products need input and development. I need to be communicating to everyone involved what's happening so that they know and can help work through some of these issues. But all this means there's a lot of money floating out, right? Like money for all the stuff I'm about to sell that's now pushed back a couple weeks. Money going out into this next line of things, money that's going to be spent on ads, money that's going into creative, plus all the things to manage the businesses I already have. And I'm going to be overseas for a few weeks. Like this is the kind of stuff where it's, it's obstacles left and right. And God knows what's going to come up. Like there's entity structure things, there's tax issues, there's this paperwork and that paperwork. It doesn't stop. And so my life becomes less like creative vision and more just like I am pumping through whatever this is every single day. And it will get better, but I'm fine with it. And I could live with all this because I have frameworks to tackle it. And that's what we're going to talk through here is I'm gonna actually break all those down so you can use them. And the first framework is about reducing perfection and going for evolution. So many creatives I know hold things in or brand owners wait on things until they're exactly right versus launching and evolve. Eliminate that from your mind, go and build upon it. And this ties to the second piece and explain. Life is about explanation. I worked at a lot of physical product startups where the product didn't that shipped ended up like, hey, we shipped this, but this accessory we promised wasn't ready. Or we took pre-orders, but this delay was like 60 days. I worked at all these tech companies that did that. And everyone was always like, should we not tell anyone at all? Should we tell them something else? There's always these conversations about like, what do you really want to communicate to customers? And the answer is always just be transparent and explain exactly what's happening to a T. And that is something that I think is really relevant, both to consumers you sell to and to internal teams and blockades. So what do I mean by that? A lot of creative issues and people get stumped in obstacles at work with people not understanding their vision and where they're trying to go. You're trying to make better social content, but you just can't because no one gets it. They want to sign budget to it or no one wants to execute the ideas you know will work. They just want to keep doing the stuff that doesn't work. They won't give you a shot to do X thing or Y thing. Whatever. A lot of, there's just a lot of inner company communication that gets people stuck up, especially creatives because so many people don't understand what you do. They have some half-formed opinion on it and then have to govern it. And so you want to be an explainer. I'll talk about that from a brand perspective and a corporate perspective. So brand perspective. One of my favorite people that does this is Ryan from low key industries. So they do a lot of pre-order sales. He'll put out an item, buy it. You have to wait your 60, 75 days to receive it. But he has a little format on Instagram stories. It's like check boxes. And it's like order placed, you know, fabric being cut, garments being dyed, you know, final pick and pack shipped. And basically he'll check and he'll put a target date on every stage. So if you've ordered something from him and you're following on Instagram and you're a fan, you can basically be like, oh, I'm, I understand where the status of my garment is. I get regular updates when he has it. If you do that and you're emailing people, you're going to have way less questions or returns or angry people about someone waiting for a pre-order because you know what's happening. It doesn't take him much to just check those off and make sure they're posting in. He's developed a framework with which he can communicate and make sure that any of those people that will come up that will eat and sap his energy and time being like, where's my shit? Why isn't this done yet? He's, he's handling it. I love that approach. Same thing goes for inner communication inside a creative department. If it's you communicating to your manager, if it's you as a manager creating to other parts of the org, one thing I've done at every company I've been a manager at is a written update to the other executives or to my boss every week with what is going on with my team. Here's what were the tasks that were completed. Here's the obstacles we dealt with. Here's the things we think we did well. Here's a plan for next week, that format. And if you are remote or you're trying to get the attention of your boss, or make sure you are setting yourself up for the best way in your career, being that communicator so that people know what you're responsible for and what you're doing and what's going well and what's not is like a great communication point. And if you do that within an org, you start to realize questions. Questions and issues get out of the way early. You can justify things early and plant seeds early. And then people also, when they're dealing with type A creatives who are explaining things and showing things, they start to worry less and get involved less because they're like, look, there's someone here who's thinking this through and presenting it that's actually doing it. I can't recommend enough the explainer format to deal with those obstacles like at 
work. It's just a consistent thing you use. And we've got breakdown time allocation. So many people will have an obstacle come up and they will freeze because they don't know what to do. And there are two tactics that really help with this. The first is make a list. What are your options? So for instance, I don't have enough creative for my brand account. I can A, carve more individual time out on my end to create more creative. I can hire a full-time creator. I can hire a designer, a brief to do specific type of creative. I can hire a video editor. I can book a shoot. Me listing that out gives me options. And I put that op- those options on a timeline. I need to make a decision to do this by Tuesday so I can have onboarded by Friday when I leave on a flight or whatever. And you can give yourself arbitrary time. I have this issue coming up in my life. I need to be able to do X or Y. I just solve this by Tuesday. And you work back. Okay, so to make that decision, say I want to go with option three. I'm going to hire a designer out. I need to find out who that is. I need to contact these three people. I need to write my initial briefs. It means I need to get my references for my briefs. Then you put that on a calendar. I think the calendar is the most underused thing in a creative world possible, right? Because we use our calendars at work. But every one of these things that we want to do should have like time and lock-ins, right? Like if you want to, if you right now are too overwhelmed to create your options list for what you want to do to solve a problem, okay, I'm gonna, I need to have that done by Monday. I'm going to put 30 minutes on the calendar Sunday night where I'm going to go decide. And then you can actually break down all the actions you have there and put it in a little 30 30 minute increments and do that on your night, your weekend, during your day, whatever it is. But like, if you set that time aside, you begin to understand the timing you have. Because I've heard people take freelance projects or vision projects or trying to work through things at work. If you schedule something or understand what your bandwidth is like or understand what things take and then put things into those slots, you're able to break down issues into specific things you can use to solve it. And so for instance, like I'm dealing with these shoe problems of like, I can't get the right leather and color of the thing I want X and Y. So my options are either like, all right, I get more things sent back and forth to me from the factory. I hire somebody on the ground there to go hunt stuff down for me. I get another factory involved to handle it. Or I go there. I said, okay, I'm going to go there. Now I'm doing that. Now I said, what's my breakdown for how do I make this successful? Cool. I need to let them know the objectives I'm trying to achieve while I'm there. I need to prepare for where else I can go to make sure I can get the things that I want while we're doing. I need to schedule the times that we're going to hit on that. I need to make sure I brief it. Here's the time I'm going to make the brief. Here's the deadline with which I'm going to send them this email. And here's all the things I need to communicate. That just went for a breakdown with associated times related to it to turn an obstacle into a thing that's done. If you can just be the person that does this, which is what I call having a bias for action. Anytime something happens, you just do that. You go, here's my options. Here's what I need to have this figured out by. Here's all the things need to happen for me to get to options or to get to figuring this out. And you put that into your task list and your calendar. You are a person with a bias for action. You become pretty much unstoppable and you get to see, you know what? I don't have time to deal with that issue. All of a sudden your options change. I just can't do this. You know, or you begin to say, actually, I have more time than I thought I could add this or that on. You begin to have an understanding of your life and the things flowing in and out of it that enable you to move. And then you become the kind of person that's like, oh, you're, you can be an entrepreneur. Oh, you can be a successful freelancer. Oh, you can execute amazingly on your work because you have these frameworks to kind of operate in. Then there's finding your peers. If you're dealing with obstacles, other people around you are probably going through them. One of the biggest things that's been helpful for me as a creator going through these last few months is I'm friends with a lot of other creators of a similar size. We have group chats together. I have one-on-ones together. So people like Ashwin, who makes really similar content to me, a brand reaches out, but hey, that brand reach out to you. What do they offer you? What do they offer me? You can get some comparisons. You can price things right. Group chat, a bunch of other creators. Hey, guess what? My many chat posts where people comment for a DM aren't doing as well. Is that happening with you too? Okay, yes, we should actually all stop using many chat. Like issues that come up being able to be solved by peers, so they see it and you can run stuff off them is like super useful. And that's another thing you can just break down. You don't have those peers yet? Okay, well, that means I need to be sending a couple of DMs every month to people trying to make them be peers. So I need to actually set a time where I write a couple of options for that DM. All right, I'm gonna do this on this day. I need to find people to DM, which means I need to intentionally scroll. Okay, I'm going to do 30 minutes Tuesdays and Thursdays where I actually scroll to specifically to find people that I, you know are my peers I should be trying to reach out to. And then I reach out to people on those Thursdays with what I wrote. And all of a sudden, at the end of every month, I'm starting to have two or three more people in my network. Like That is using the same problem solving to begin to establish like a peer group that you can begin to work through and have a relationship with. And if you start asking people questions or running things by them or working on your obstacles with them, they'll begin to do the same. You guys can learn from each other within those frameworks, which ties into asking and going outbound. The biggest superpower you have to solve things is asking. I suddenly had an expense come up on a trip to China. Cool. I went down my list of people that I work with and went, okay, who do I think might need something in China where I can give them value by being on the ground that they'll pay me for to help offset this cost? Email five or six of them, immediately had one be like, yeah, it'd really be helpful if you could do this thing. If I hadn't been able to get it from any people in my network, I would have tried to go outside my network, send some LinkedIn DMs, send some emails, whatever, offset that. Think of some content pitches, whatever it is, be able to do something. But that ability to say, I'm gonna just be able to hit people up and make an ask and try to provide value for them in exchange for money or be able to get a thing, like it's just something you need to beat into yourself as a way to solve obstacles. Almost everything is solved with more outreach. 
And that's really daunting for creatives, right? And the only way to make it easier is if you don't like making hard asks to people is to make soft asks and get to know people and expand your network and work through things. So when you want to make a hard ask, you've already done some of the legwork first. And I cannot recommend enough how much your life will change when you begin being the kind of person that's just going outbound constantly. The last thing I'm going to talk about is delegation. At one point in my career, I was working on Shopify all the time. My I'm okay at Liquid, I'm not amazing. And I was just coming, I was spending all kinds of time just in the back end of Shopify. So I hired somebody off of Upwork who I've now worked with for 10 years. How long have we been doing this? It was nine and a half. Doesn't matter. $30 an hour, raises up now, it's higher. Who just handles all that for me? I have an actual problem. I want to go Figma to design. I want to be able to handle a code in Liquid. I want to be able to make a landing page. I want to be able to do basic stuff like maintenance. That is just covered at a set rate with someone I trust and have worked with forever that if I need to do that for a job, they can just do it. If I need to bring someone onto a project and I can add them as an extra expense, they can just do it. You got to look at that time to value. I can do something like that and pay with my own money. Well, $75 me paying to somebody, remove this problem from my life, well, that's probably worth it. Okay, would that be $2,000? Maybe not. You begin to have that option to be able to push those things out there. And you have those people to bring on. Look, you're bringing into a client, there's work that you don't want to do or that's annoying in Shopify. Hey, I have someone who can solve this for X rate, right? And so if you begin to build that network for people you meet personally or freelancers or people on Upwork, whatever that looks like, you begin to have that little talent framework of I've got these designers, I've got these developers, I've got these other problem solvers out there that I can either pay to solve my problem or I can have someone else pay to solve my problem. You are beginning to open up like a wide scale. And you start to stack all these things together where you're like, all right, I'm going to break down all my issues. I'm going to block out my time. I'm going to make sure I'm communicating to everybody that's involved. I have my team I can delegate things to. I have peers I can ask and run questions by. I have people that if things come up, I can try and pitch them to get involved, make it easier. Now, you're never going to have a real problem. You're just going to have a thing you put on a list that gets checked off. And this transition from doing whatever it is you do in your normal life to operating like this is like such a massive shift that prepares you for anything you ever want to do in life and like turns you into an operator. And an operator is about the highest praise I can offer some, for some Somebody. And it just takes looking at those frameworks I had out here and integrating them into your life. And I cannot recommend highly enough taking the plunge to become a person like that, to never let anything hang you up again, to not be like, I had this issue come up, so I ordered Uber Eats and I took a gummy and I'm hiding. <laughs> you know, like, which happens, or because the things you're doing as a freelance project fades away. The vision you had for a brand dies. You don't get that promotion you wanted at work, whatever it looks like. Like those are things that by acting on them, by having that bias for action, by having that organization can go away. And it's a change that you can make that I cannot recommend enough as being worth it. So anyway, I'm headed to China this week. I'm gonna try and pre-record some videos so I don't miss any YouTubes while I'm out there because I am out there through two more Sundays from now, uh, but they'll be great, I promise. And when I come back, I'll have a bunch of vlogs and info on like how that whole thing works. I think it'll be super interesting. It's fascinating out there. And I appreciate you watching and I really hope you integrate some of this into your flow because I would love nothing more than for all of us to win.